ました。Welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. And we're back. We're doing brunch with BMR. Not on his show. It's brunch time <laughs> when I'm recording this, as you can tell by the blazing inferno coming in the window. And I'm not normally up this time of day. And I don't do breakfast or lunch, so I don't even know what the hell brunch is. So screw all that. Let's talk to BMR. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Well, thank you, Duke. Uh, you know, brunch is a combination. I think that's a three o'clock in the afternoon gig. You know, there's something, it's brunch, it's lunch. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, thanks for doing this. I know uh, you're up a little early. Well, <laughs> mountain time, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the opposite side of the country. So when it's like midday over there, I'm still going, why the hell am yeah. I awake? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm in darkness right now. I don't know. My face is probably blazing right now but you know what are you gonna do oh uh, we can see you pretty good and your uh lovely uh patented bmr headband yes appropriately almost uh leprechaun colors there yeah i was getting close you know, saint st patrick's day it's yep. among us saint saint alky's day <laughs> yeah there you go it's it's the day that you don't want to be out at night that's for sure if you like to partake which I have in the last couple of years. I used to go get, be at the bar right at 8 o'clock in the morning and be done by noon, go home, yeah. sleep at all. You guys remember that now. This is uh, police get their ticket quota day. It's yeah. One of those holidays. So if you're going to go out there and get plastered, make sure somebody else is driving you around. Yeah. So you don't crash into someone else and or yeah. have your life ruined by the uh, Popo tribe. Well, you know, dude, because I owned a bar for 13 years and about the third or fourth year in, on St. Patrick's, we really were packed. We were wall to wall starting at eight, nine in the morning when we opened. You know, the Popo, they came out there, they would take chalk and they marked everyone's tires. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yeah. And they See, this is what tell. you're saying how bloodthirsty and evil they are and how much they want your money and to destroy your life. Yes, absolutely. And uh, they knew all of the, uh, the routes that people would take out of there, too. And they had them. They had a squad car in every every exit, every corner. So it kind of, I mean, I get it to an extent, right? But yeah, come on. I had some uh, friends that lived up in northern Minnesota, and they had one bar within 30 miles. So guess where they all went? So, of course, the cops knew that, you know, there's only one bar around here within 30 miles. We know where the drunks are going to be leaving from when they go home. So they just made a regular racket out of busting them all the time and giving them tickets, you know, because you know, you've got to give somebody a ticket, right? No. Yep. Well, all the locals decided that we're going to counter your measures with what we call countermeasures. And their countermeasure was twofold. First of all, they all own ATVs and they had an extensive trail system. All of, many of which went to the bar. <laughs> the, the second part of their system was that they had CB radios. So they would be informing each other when they saw one of the Popo tribe guys running around. And then the rest of them would tell which route to take through the woods to get back home and safely avoid all of them. <laughs> well, you know, I tell you what, that's, you know, that sounds really familiar because in North, if you get to Northern Michigan, let's say you're in the mid part of Michigan all the way to the UP. There's a lot of bars, which are really cool, that are stashed away in the woods. 
and you can only get there in the winter time by snowmobile. Mm-hmm. So people just you know take their sleds, snowmobiles, whatever you call them for whatever part of town you live on, right? And they would crank them in and have a good old time. And but sure enough, you know there was um, law enforcement out there on their sleds, right? And uh, <laughs> so, which is completely pointless. Yeah, they're adults. If they want to get hurt, that's their problem. Yes. And what's the chance that you're going to plow your snowmobile into somebody in the woods and damage them? Give no. me a freaking break. That's I, indefensible, no. and you guys are assholes. That's what they all say. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they weren't. They got bad about it for a couple of years. I haven't been there in a, many years, so who knows what it's like now up there? But yeah, I always thought that was like, come on, give me a break. Yeah. Uh, leave the adults alone, you morons. And they're all locals. It's not like some Yahoo from Detroit's going up there on a sled. <laughs> <laughs> if he is, he's driving that sled a long way on yeah. some rough going. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And if he's getting on it, he's doing 10 miles an hour because he don't know how to maneuver him down here anyway. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> okay, well let's uh, let's talk about some uh, Bigfoot and yeah. Bigfoot related stuff. Uh, as you all know, uh, Bigfoot Michigan Rob hasn't been really in the community all that long since he had a recent experience a few years ago, and he contacted me, and I gave him some you know what I hope was kind of sage advice at the time to help him figure out what was going on. And uh, since then, he's become really popular and. Uh, Lots of podcasts over on uh, YouTube, and he's on like 30 podcasts a week. So like <laughs> yeah. every couple hours, you can watch something that Rob's on. You know, yes. Yeah. Constantly around the clock. <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, what a better way to uh, spend your day, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, how that all unfolded, Duke. You know, I had my encounter 2018, and and then, you know, I mean – and then it was a tragedy. We're not getting into my encounter. Everyone's whole, heard about it. And then I had the death of Cindy two months after the encounter in 2018 uh, out there in uh, at Lake Cadillac. And then I immersed myself in it. You know, I immersed myself in it prior to the death. But after the death, I went dark six months. I owned a bar at the time. And I gave the guy the keys. I said, just take care of the situation. Take care of the bar. Don't rip me off. Just let me figure out what's happened and um you were one of the first guys i did contact and uh you know i knew you as brian sullivan see this is how green i was in 2018 because i never really was on youtube for anything i didn't really know much about the community and i didn't even realize that it was so big on the internet right with all these shows and podcasts and you were known as brian sullivan in fact the very first picture i saw of you was not even you it was some dude on your channel holding a big largemouth bass i go oh that must be duke sullivan or brian <laughs> sullivan then i found out now that that wasn't you there was some guy you had on a show showing off his fish and uh but no you were one of the first guys to steer me in the right direction and gave me great great advice and uh about two years ago, I did uh, start a Bigfoot Michigan Rob channel, and I got involved with Tex over there. So yeah, we're on every day, and and because of you though, I thank you greatly because you know for a couple of years there, I had nowhere to go, and I was just down and out, and I I blame this creature, for the actual death of uh, my girlfriend at the time. Today I know that's not true. I do believe that today. Um, I don't think that Bigfoot's an evil entity. Now, what I saw, who knows? Because I'll even say I've talked to many people, especially Robin. And hey, when something turns from a humanoid into like what appear to be a demon, it's gonna freak. It's gonna freak you out, you know. So yeah, no kidding. <laughs> come on, and you know, he yelled, he growled at me all in unison. Got hit with a sonic boom, as you like to say. Knocked her off the boat. I saw black and white and. I tell you what, it scare anybody. It would scare anybody. It certainly scared me. And uh, But, again, thank you to you, though. Again, one of the first people that I just found. And uh, I, we've been friends ever since, for since, like, 2018. And I appreciate everything you've done for me. And uh, and I respect you. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, the, you're my go-to guy when I have a question, as you well know. 
Well, thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. You know, I'm the mentor. Yes. The BMR mentor. is all my fault. Yes, the creation. <laughs> you, can, you can blame me for that, that you have the cool BMR on every day, 30 yeah, times a week. That's right. And thanks for that. And Duke's been on my show a handful of times, and uh, I'm sure we'll be doing another one soon. He's yet to be on my night show. Yep. I have, yeah, my two shows on uh, Tuesdays at 9 Eastern and Thursdays, one in the East. And I got other stuff on my channel too Bigfoot encounters from emailers and subscribers. And you know, the thing about it, Duke, man, is I just like these people send me these reports of these stories, and I remember where I was. I, like I said, know where to go. So I, I'm empathetic to these people today. And uh, I'll, I'm kind of like a shoulder for them to lean on, right? And just like you were for me. So I pay it forward. And that's what I do. It's really the number one reason I do what I do. I'm not a researcher. I mean, I get out in the woods. When I get out in the woods, I know what to look for. But it's not an everyday thing such as yourself. So that's something that I like to gear up towards more moving forward. Because the state of Michigan, do we've got all sorts of cryptids running around here. All sorts of high strangeness. Mm-hmm. Now, we got no shortage here either, including, you know, UFOs and giants that we have to deal with, too. And then the local wildlife, 1,000-pound grizzly bears. Yeah, it's a little kind of dangerous doing cryptid research in Montana. You know, I mean, I, well, you know, knock on wood, I mean, we've never spoken about any of your grizzly bear encounters while looking or researching Bigfoot, but I'm sure you've had a couple. No, I have not oh. ever seen a grizzly bear in the wild yet. Wow. They're not that common. Okay. And around town here, they actually set up traps for them on the far side of the mountain range, which is where they tend to wander in from. And they just basically bait them into a giant steel box, catch them, and then they haul them away and it's a couple hundred miles, drop them off in like, uh, you know, one of the wilderness areas yeah. where they're not liable to wander back again. Weren't you? Yeah, you were telling me, I think this is some time ago, where they would take. Some, especially the, the ferocious ones that have been known to do some damage. There's like a, a on the side of a mountain where they can't escape from, right? Where it's where they all, they put all the maniacal ones. Yeah, it's the uh, the Bob Marshall Wilderness area. There's yeah. essentially no roads going into it. And one of the coolest things in the lower 48 that most people don't know about, even though they've heard about, oh, Glacier Park, you know, that's in Montana. Yeah. And part of Yellowstone, that's in Montana. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's this other cool thing that you haven't heard about and you haven't seen because there's no road that goes to it. And it's called the Great Wall. The Great Wall is a cliff face that's 1,000 feet high and 22 miles long. Wow. And that's what's on the edge of the Bob Marshall. So grizzly bears can't climb down a 1,000-foot cliff to get out again. So they're kind yeah. of stuck there. <laughs> okay. So I guess. It's to like, think of the, the lost world, you know, where they're on top of yeah. the plateau. I mean, like, literally, that's what's going on here. <laughs> so I would imagine not too many people do research over there unless you got some really thick, Cajones. I don't know of any Bigfoot researchers that are uh, doing any active research in that area. It's possible they've done it in the past. But I've actually talked to uh, three people that I randomly ran into that I don't even know. And, you know, they were just talking about something and got on the subject. And uh, all three of them had been in the Bob Marshall. All three of them said they would never go back. And two of them, I said, well, why? You know, I was trying to pin them down. Well, it's really rugged. Well, that describes most of Western Montana. Well, yeah. there's a lot of mountain lions there. There's a lot of mountain lions everywhere in western Montana. Uh, well, they couldn't really give me a good excuse. Guy number three, I pinned down enough that he went, well, let me level with you. I was walking up the bank of the river, following the river, and I came across these huge human-looking tracks that were about 18 inches long, or 17 inches long, that's what he said. Yeah. And I followed him for about a quarter mile just to make sure what I was looking at and that it wasn't a bear or something. And then I swam across the river and I hiked out and I'm never going back there again. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, well, a couple of stories you told me about that. It's like, yeah, no, no, thank you. I mean, and then I, and then of course I got involved. I started watching grizzly bear attacks on YouTube. I'm like, no, I just have to stop, stop with this. Now we don't have them here, but it's still. Yeah, luckily, I know some of these states are like, oh, we don't have grizzlies anymore. And I always go, hey, 
I'd like to be helpful. We have a surplus. Would you like us to ship yeah. some there? Because we would be more than happy to accommodate you in your grizzly shortage problem. But but you know what is so strange though, Duke? It's like, okay, I say today we don't have grizzly bears, but twenty years ago, you couldn't even find wolves in Michigan. But now all of a sudden they're they're certainly in the UP. They're 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 coming in. So from where? I mean, they certainly can migrate from Minnesota. state to state. Minnesota, when I, when I was a little kid, uh, northern Minnesota was the only place in the lower 48 there were still timber wolves. Yeah. And they've just spread from there because they're not doing anything to control the population. So as they breed and they make more little ones, well, then the little ones move out and make their own packs and they slowly spread out and then they take over the UP and wherever they can get to without swimming, they'll show up there eventually, you know. Yeah, for sure. No, we have the same kind of problem here right now, but it's the uh, a non-indigenous species because at one time we did have timber wolves here and they tried to reintroduce wolves and I think they screwed up and put in like red wolves or something, which didn't last very well. And they couldn't deal with the huge animals that they have here in order to take them down and eat them. So they ended up like more screwing around with the farmers than the ranchers, you know, than trying to actually uh, use the prey animals around here effectively. And then there's uh, timber wolves are in here now. But the other thing is apparently in north uh, western Montana, they're starting to get sightings of these really big wolves, which look mysteriously like uh, Mackenzie Valley timber wolves. And Mackenzie, <laughs> Mackenzie Valley wolves are like about 175 pounds and lanky. So whereas it takes a whole pack of wolves to take down one elk, it takes three of these things to take down one elk, and they're not indigenous to this area. Frankly, if I was in charge, I would put all the uh, all the guys I could spare out there right now to eradicate them out of the state before they get much of a foothold. Oh, absolutely. You know, it reminds me of something. I, I was. But here, I here's a, the thing, though, Rob. Our suspicion yeah. is that they were introduced because there's a big chunk of land in between where they come from and here where there aren't any. Oh, wow. Okay. So the do that, nothing right putting their fingers into the pie where they shouldn't butt out and leave well enough alone. You want to pull that crap? Do what the Flathead Indians want. They've got a whole pile of buffalo up there and they want to reint reintroduce them into the wild because they've got extra. But the state's like, oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, we can have friggin' grizzly bears and non indigenous Mackenzie Valley wolves running around, but we can't have the indigenous buffalo running around. You know what you can suck on with that one? <laughs> no doubt. It seemed like I, I, I was talking to a person the other day, not too long ago. They had um, it's a, they had some encounters of something going on at their house, and they live in Alabama. And now this this guy was telling me this happened in the 1990s. Now in Alabama, the red wolf used to roam Alabama, but they've been extinct, right, for the longest time. They've been moved out the government whatever they did and he's now having wolf tracks oversized wolf tracks in his yard and he can't put his finger on it and again who the heck knows what's going on with this right just like you were just one of those things where you're looking at the tracks going are these bipedal no <laughs> damn it they're regular wolves i'd rather yeah. have a dog man around here than these friggin things <laughs> yeah you know so he goes, do you think that's dog man? I'm like, well, no. And then I had a story where it ended up being, I think, a dog man because all of a sudden the four tracks turned into bipedal. So I'm like, so you just don't know. That's why I've always, you know, my brother hunts all the time in northern Michigan. And, and yeah, he sees wolf tracks. Now, they're not dog man. They are legitimate wolves. But it's like, where do they come from, as you were saying? And it's just, it's just amazing. And to me, it's amazing how everything like like we have black panthers in michigan right they're supposed to not be in michigan yet there's always a sighting so you just don't know when you're in the woods i guess the bottom line is expect the unexpected yeah not not necessarily even just weird cryptids and stuff like we usually talk about there's yeah uh non-indigenous animals pop up in weird places where you wouldn't expect them to be see i always need to be keeping your eye out for what the hell's going on around you just in case I mean, you do because it's just last summer, and this is, and I live in southern, 
southeast Michigan. There's nothing here. There's, yes, there's deer. There's deer that run across the freeway because we do have wooded freeways. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. You want to go hunting, drive the freeway. You know, oh, God. You know, <laughs> That's northern know. Minnesota, buddy. Everybody you know? up there hates the deer. The only reason they hunt them is because they want to kill off enough that they don't run into them with their cars anymore. <laughs> So, but this is the strangest thing. My brother lives by a baseball field. He does not live far from me. And, dude, we live in these suburbs. You know, it's it's just, there's no woods. Okay, there's a creek that runs through our city, which leads to the Detroit River. And, yes, there's a wood line, but it's nothing that you, it's nothing special. So, this is last summer, and we're sitting on his porch, and we're looking at the ball field. And it's getting dusky dark. And we see, like, on the north top of the ball field, it's a big, it's about a half acre. It's a nice, nice, it's a nice park with a small, where the creek runs through with a little bit of a wood line. And we see, like, three or four emerging from the far wood line. We see what we think are, like, kind of unusual dogs. And they're, they're not big, but they're not little. And they're running and they're galloping. They're galloping. It's a horse chair, but they're running, you know, getting closer and closer. And if they were not a pack of coyotes, which we've never had here, not where I live, okay? Not yeah. in the suburbs, not without the closest forest from us is maybe 30 miles. So they must have came from the creek somehow. And, and yeah, no kidding. So it took, so the story goes, we've seen these things. They take off, and now they're running through the neighborhood. They're getting in people's trash, their garbage, and they had to come out with a special task force to get these things out. And that was just last summer, and it was like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, pretty much anywhere that you live in the continental U.S., you could expect to have uh, dumpster bandits, and by that I mean raccoons. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of places you don't really have much in the way of coyotes, and it's not a good thing no. when they start showing up because that means no. all of your smaller pets are going to go on the menu and they're going to disappear too. Absolutely. Oh yeah, we see that. My brother, he has a nice, beautiful dog, kept it indoors until, and it, it became a problem. These things were really going through people's yards. Now I cannot say if any animals or pets were maimed or eaten or taken away, but. Certainly, it was causing havoc in your garbage and, and all around. And you didn't have your little children outside because they were roaming. They finally took care of the problem. But the main question is, where did they come from? You know, it's just, it just seems so weird. So Yeah. Let's just say if uh, a certain uh, researcher was animal friendly and he decided to do pet missing 411, number one suspect would be coyotes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I believe it. Yeah, and uh, wolves do some of that too. As a matter of fact, there's uh, wolves like to uh, trick dogs. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of stories about a female wolf coming in and trying to go, hey, baby, and getting the dog all amorous and stuff and get him to follow the lady wolf out in the woods, and then the wolf pack tears him apart and eats him. <laughs> right. That's happened a bunch of times. People, you know, this shit really happens. So. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, it does, so... Well, anyway, another thing that we're uh, going to be talking about in the uh, future here on one of your 30 or so shows that you're doing every week is uh, Giants. You're doing an on ongoing thing about Giants on there. And I was just watching something uh, earlier about, um, what is it? It's on a channel called Everything Inside Me. And they were talking about how a skeleton had been discovered in India about 100 years ago. A uh, farmer was digging, and this big bone was kind of sticking out of this hill's uh, embankment. And uh, he didn't know what the hell it was. I mean, it sure, it sure didn't look like any kind of bone he'd ever seen, so he tried digging it up, and it was just too big. He couldn't do it. So he told the other locals that this bone was there, and they came to try and help him. And again, it was so gigantic, they still yeah. couldn't get it out. So they gave the report to the, the local guy who was like the mayor magistrate of the area or whatever, and he actually ordered a crew in there and paid for it to have this bone taken out. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't just one bone. They had the whole skeleton in there. Oh, and when wow. they dug it up, it was a appeared to be a giant ape, 32 feet tall. No. Yeah. 
And the skeleton, of course, has since disappeared because the British were running India at the <clears> time. <throat> so you can about guess where that went to. Yeah. And, well, it doesn't surprise me that that's disappeared. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing, too. Now, the Indians still, you know, of course, know all about this and remember it, and especially in the local area. And what they claim is that they think that was the remains of Hanuman, the monkey god. Okay. And that's, you know, so that was his remains. There's this giant monkey god. And they have the same kind of mythology that we have, only a little bit different, you know, where we have the uh, fallen angels mating with human women, producing hybrid yeah. children called the Nephilim. And the, the announcer on the show was saying like, oh, well, you know, these were the product of gods mating with women, so they're Nephilim. Well, no, they're demigods. Yeah, right. And angels aren't gods. So this is a different thing. They're more powerful, actually, if you yeah. want to look at it that way. And then this also goes back to, you know, who is who is Hanuman in charge of? Well, he was the god over the Venara, which is their word, apparently, for Sasquatch. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I find it a little interesting how you mentioned 32-foot ape because, <clears throat> excuse me, I've never really heard of an ape being 30 feet right i mean hell no there should never ever be anywhere near that size you know no, I, nothing about that says natural it all says weird unnatural you know, something that shouldn't be going on happened here <laughs> yeah you know and i'm even trying to wonder that if it even was right i mean they said mm -hmm. ape and of course now the bones are gone I mean, yeah. they made mention well, the that time they dug this up, they examined all the bones really carefully. And this wasn't like 500 years ago. It was about 100 yeah. years ago. Okay. They had pretty good doctors and skeletal experts and stuff okay. looked at it. And they went, it's not it's not 100% an ape. That was the other thing they pointed out. It looked like some kind of weird hybrid. Like yeah. it had ape-like characteristics and it also had human-like characteristics. Mm -hmm. Who does that sound like? Well, sounds like uh, Bigfoot, right? Uh huh. So, giant Bigfoot? You know, maybe that was their I, leader. Yeah. But Hanuman's in all the uh, the stories and stuff over there, and apparently he was the one that gave the order for the Venara to help Lord Rama to build uh, Adam's Bridge, the causeway from the mainland of India out to the island of Sri Lanka, and then they also volunteered to be his army because he wanted to go get his girlfriend back from. Uh, Lanka, the also called Ravana, the overlord who was running the island of Sri Lanka at the time, had a whole army of giants. And for whatever reason, the Venara, the Sasquatch, were really keen to get out there on that island and kill the shit out of every giant on it. And they got their wish. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you then, too, Duke. You know, we are doing this series on Wednesdays. And uh, in fact, you may be, uh, we, if we might try to slot you in for one of the days, I don't know how long the series is going to run because you certainly know a lot about the subject. The, the thing, and I talked to Jason, he's pretty knowledgeable. And my thing is, now when I think giants, and I've spoken with you many times, and I've done my own reading and, or, you know, research on the computer, I suppose. And you got the Nephilim, you know, you've got angels mating with humans, the demigods. Now, you hear these stories about these giants, though, that look like humans, right? But they might have the four rows of teeth. I can never get it straight on uh, the giants that are the 30-foot tall. I mean, we see the stories about the giant that's as tall as a tree or tower over a tree. Now, was that in the biblical days? Is that like during Noah? I mean, did we really have giants that big? Oh, according to the Bible, there were giants that big because they talk about the height of the first generation of giants measured in L's. And L's is like three feet or something. And I have to go back and look at it. But it's big. And you're measuring it in three-foot increments. They're freaking really, really big. you know. And they're talking about these guys being like 100-plus feet tall which would explain why the rest of the story is that, well, okay, there was these guys and they're really gigantic and they kind of ate all the animals in the local area. And then they kind of ate all the plants in the local area. And then they kind of ran out of food, so they ate all the humans in the local area. Well, there's a the problem with them. Yeah. And they started running low on food. They started eating everything. And then according to the biblical narrative, the uh, uh, God sent one of the angels to go down and uh, get them to start conflict with each other, basically, 
he was like the secret agent that was trying to get them to start a war with each other, which succeeded. And a lot of them wiped each other out. Okay. And the flood was to wipe out the remainder of them. Now, apparently there were some vestige of their, either their bloodline uh, remained or my, my thought is that, you know, they're always associated with having underground spaces and stuff. And we found tunnel systems and shit that are like 30 feet high built in the ancient times. Nobody's going to tunnel out that much rock to make a 30 foot high tunnel, but they're not 30 foot tall. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. This isn't done with modern equipment. You're not going to spend umpteen hundreds of years digging out a 30 foot high passage when you only need one that's six feet high. See what I'm yes. saying? Yeah. So we know that they were underground too. So my, my guess is that some of them just survived by hiding underground basically. And then after the flood, they came back out again. And the biblical narrative always talks about the Rephaim, which is the the ones who have risen again, is basically what that um, yeah. sort of references. And it makes you wonder if, you know, they had risen from the dead or had they risen from underground and come back up on the surface? Because they weren't clinging to the side of the ark for yeah. uh, all that time while that uh, big storm was going on. And yeah. they weren't on board it. Um, so they did come back afterwards. And then you get all of the early, early... Uh, post-flood biblical stuff where there were tribes of giants and there's there's 22 named giants and 36 giant tribes in the biblical narrative that are named in the bible and one of the things that people always don't understand about it is that you know well, why was god so mean back in the olden days and then like he had a kid and it mellowed him out and everything like no 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 same god hasn't changed opinion when he was ordering the israelites to go into these certain areas and like i'm giving you this land See that tribe that's over there right now? Wipe them out completely. Yeah. All of them. Kill their livestock too, which is also included in some of those orders. And you're like, why the heck would you want to do that? Because you always take that as tribute and stuff, you know? I mean, when you capture somebody's stuff, you get their stuff. Why yeah. would you want to do that? Why? Because God wants us to sacrifice all the, these animals that really we need to eat and everything? No. Right. The reason God wanted to get rid of the animals is the same reason God wanted to get rid of the people that owned them. Their GMO. They were okay. never supposed to exist. And these suckers have been tinkering around with the animals. And that's right in the biblical narrative, too. That was one of the things that really twerked God off to start with. And it lists, you know, they were messing with the fish. They were messing with the animals. You know, they were messing with the birds. They were messing with the livestock. They were GMO modifying everything. And that's another one of the reasons for the flood. Wipe out all this crap the giants made. You know, it's funny. Yeah. And, and what you made mention with the Raphaim, like I remember on our show Wednesday, we were Talking about the Rephaim has risen from the dead, right? A different mm -hmm. subject, but we were going, that's what the narrative we went with. But we also had, a, it was on the archaeology of the Nephilim or giants. And in and, and this particular show, Jason had a lot of side uh, slides and looking at a lot of the tools that perhaps giants use. And it was so, it was really cool the way it was laid out because there was like, um, I would say like hatchet or axe heads that you could tell they were shaped kind of like an axe and there was like six of them and one, the, the smallest one I couldn't pick up with my hand yep. at all. The biggest one, dude, it had to have been four foot long. I mean, it was something, a mammoth person with the hands 10 times the size of ours would have to pick up, right? Yeah. And then there were spears with that were like, shoot, fifteen foot long with a and a, with a five pound spearhead at the end. Yeah. So and they find these things. So for me, yeah, something thirty. Yeah, you know, feet, apparently feet, some 60. of these, apparently some of these giants were around fairly recently too, because if you look at uh, things like they got a they got a samurai sword that's like ten feet long. Yeah. But what the hell? You know, they haven't been making that style of sword for all that long. It's been, you know, a few hundred years. It isn't thousands of years that they've been making them. No. So whoever they made that thing for was, uh, you know, alive in the last few centuries. And, you know, again, there are all these accounts and, and even photographs from the early eras of when photography started of giants. They've got pictures of these guys that are twice as tall as a normal person standing next to them. You can find them if you go looking around for them. They're not Photoshopped. Those are actual pictures. They yeah. just don't have any other information to go with them. So they're like, oh, this guy appears to be taller than, you know, Robert Wadlow. But no <laughs> one put a tape measure on him, so we don't know. Right. And yes. maybe they faked a picture. Ah, shut the hell up. Quit making it. Yeah, I know. That was not a fake. I got this camera I could see upstairs. I had to run up there. There was a package delivery. Mm. 
Right. Still on Drop, a Dropping off that box of giant bones you had shipped in from Kandahar. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that I don't... Uh, that's the big mystery to me, how, you know, the Smithsonian supposedly had all those bones. Yeah, I've been over that and over it and over it and over it. And I got a book that's got actual, the, the original newspaper clippings of all these stories where they yeah. came out in the newspaper, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times it's got a picture of the bones and everything, too. And every single yeah. one of them ends up with, and then the friendly gentleman from the Smithsonian took the bones away for further study, never to be seen again. Yeah, you yeah. know. You know, when we talk about bones, <clears throat> I kind of remind, I know you had uh, Daniela Diva on, or Danielle Diva. Talk about the true history of uh, Vlad. Yeah, and quick, quick uh, plug for my show. Uh, first of all, she's about to do that show with uh, BMR, too. And it'll also be on Texas Front Porch, the guy who can't spell Dracula. But she's yeah. going to be back on my show again soon, talking about the uh, Knights Templar. Uh, oh, Jacques wow. Molay and Philip the uh, Jerk from France. <laughs> 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 and how it only took the uh, Vatican 500 years to decide that, oh, my goodness, Jacques de Molay wasn't actually evil, and we burned him by accident. We're so sorry. Yeah, 500 years after the fact. Shut up. Oh, God. I just love that we bring things out like that, Duke. I do. It's hilarious. It is. And, you know, going back to that point, and it's a little off the giant subject, I want your thought on this because I know you pretty much know a lot about everything. Do you remember the... They had those sarcophaguses, or they had these crypts, and I think it was somewhere um, Romania. And again, it has nothing to do with Vlad, okay? But it happens to be in that, that part of the, the country or the continent where they're talking about vampirism, vampires, and they had people that they were uncovering. These archaeologists were unearthing an area doing their their work, their discoveries, looking for whatever, and they found actual skeletons that had stakes run, run through the, the heart and they had like big rocks in their mouth to so the mouth couldn't move and they had like fangs and it seemed like the stake had them just secured so they could not get out now we all heard the myth the legends of vampires and dracula we all get that but i'm wondering what that was i my i was thinking that they thought that these things existed, right? And and if they thought you were a vampire, then that's what they went and did. When indeed, watching the show that you did a couple weeks ago, I'm kind of I'm, I'm speculating that wasn't even that. Now people were probably getting murdered for being a vampire when in fact they weren't. Yeah, I'm sure there was some of that. You know, vampires are widely believed in throughout not only Europe but other places too. Even the Chinese and stuff had stories about vampires. That goes back. Long, 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 long way. Yeah. There's probably something to it. But the reason for the stake thing is because the uh, in order to, to stop the undead from rising again, the first thing you have to do in dealing with them is pin them in place. And if you pound a stake through their heart into the coffin to pin them in place, yeah, right. then if they decide to wake up and uh, pitch a, a fit about it, they can't really go very far, can they? No, and then right. the second part of getting rid of the vampire is to either cut its head off and burn the body in the head or yeah. if you're going to leave it there then you have to cram like a big rock in its mouth or something and uh, you also cut the head off to make sure that it can't you know clomp down with its fangs on anybody after that because uh, i don't know maybe the head can go flying around by itself or something all this yeah. kind of weird stuff but whether there actually were any you know physical vampires with fangs they were rising from the dead or anything like that. It's kind of irrelevant to the, the fact that people literally believed this stuff was going on. Yeah. So if there was like, you know, there were several cases where someone would die and then there'd be outbreak of disease in the village or something. And that's usually associated with them thinking a vampire was doing it too. So they'd go dig up the coffins of the people that had recently been buried and check them to see if they're vampires. Yeah. And if they had any of the signs, like they weren't rotting, the uh, one of the signs that they would say was that you're you're uh, gum line back from the gum line, which happens when you're dead. They just didn't. Really yeah, it, it does. And then yes. Sometimes your corpse will exude a little blood. So you'll have a little bit of blood at the edges of your, your yeah. lips or something like that. Oh, my God, he was sucking on somebody's blood. Those things all happen naturally as That's a result a natural of decomposition. Yeah. On the other hand, they've had some where this shit had been going on for months. And they dig up a corpse that had been buried three months ago, 
and it wasn't showing any of these signs and it looked like it was alive it still had the like normal living flesh color and uh that's when they were pretty sure they had a vampire but in any case if they thought they had one this was you know the methodology for dealing with it varied from place to place but usually it was nail it down with a, a cross through the heart so it can't flop around and attack you and cut the head off and you know burn the head or something yeah, it was funny too. If you go back to Louisiana, you know, we talk about the voodoo, we talk about the undead. And when I say undead, I'm talking like zombies, not vampires. Do you know, I'm sure you've heard this too, where back in the day, these witch doctors, right, if, if they came across an enemy or someone threatened them, they could work up a concoction. I'm not going to say it's a spell so much, Duke, but I will say that they had these herbs that they could kind of slow your heart rate and just make you really just lethargic. Oh, you're talking about like the Haitian zombie. Yeah, oh, and they would bear, yeah, and then they would bury you yeah. in a coffin, but now you would awake and now you're now you're alive and you started to dig out. They didn't yeah. have you in a coffin, you just buried you and then and then all of a sudden people would see these human beings coming up out of their graves and where they got the big zombie theory. Yep. Yeah. And apparently there's actual science to back that up, too, because they, for a long time, were getting rumors that the voodoo doctors were doing this with some kind of a concoction they were making. And at some point, somebody either got the formula or got their hands on some of it and tested it. And uh, amongst other components, one of them is the uh, puffer fish, mm. which will kill you deader than shit if you eat the wrong part of it, like instantly. Right, uh, okay. And they were using this to basically, it would... Uh, Stun you, knock you out, uh, put you into a coma, then they'd bury you. And then after it wore off, you'd wake up in the cop and trying to tunnel your way back to the surface. And one of the side effects from it is that you'd be like partially brain dead and pretty docile after the fact. <laughs> There's been people that were zombified that got away from the, the voodoo doctor that zombified them and were actually, you know, w once again, put in contact with their relatives and even sort of remembered what happened and could talk about it. And this is what they said was going on. Well, yeah, I mean, so no, I, I mean, if you think about it, what they're doing is they're getting free labor for their, and down there it's like sugarcane plantations and stuff. Okay. All the time. Yeah. They could just go get somebody that they didn't like and give them this little concoction, zombify them, and then they turn him into a, a slave on their friggin' plantation and nobody would be the wiser because everybody thought he was dead. <laughs> right. Can you imagine? Good way to get your free labor. Yeah, turn people into zombies. <laughs> free know. zombie labor. Of course, don't know much work they would do. Yeah. You know, like, well, they weren't yeah. working very fast, but they <laughs> no. work pretty continuously. <laughs> <laughs> continuously work through the night, but not get much done. You know. Yeah, we used to joke about that with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the evil undead overlords having zombie yeah. armies that would do all their work for them and stuff. And well, yeah, they smell terrible. And they can only go out at night, but they don't get tired and they work for free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. But, you yeah. know, uh, that's, a, that's a fabulous thing about all these things, whatever you're into, because a lot of these myths or a lot of these legends, they're contrived from somewhere and they're not all made up, right? A, a story that comes up, whatever genre you're in there are some there's some truth to a lot of these yeah. which is why what we're doing you know bigfoot dog man moth man and so i would say there are these things they're out there and it's just you know it's just the mystery behind them right yeah you get all these stories that you know people aren't saying the same things over and over and over again just for 15 seconds of fame there's credibility and truth to all these things that we that we discover well, yeah, realistically, I mean, back in the olden days, there was no such thing as fiction writing. That category of writing did not even exist. So all of the stuff that nowadays we presume was fiction, we yeah. put under the category of mythology. To them, it wasn't mythology. Just right. like to, to us here in the West, all the stories from the Hindu traditions, that's all mythology. They consider it history. Yeah. They don't think that it's mythology. They think, they think it's the actual history of what happened over there. So it's all about your perspective. And almost all of these weird 
paranormal things, whether it be zombies or vampires or yetis or whatever, there's a reason those things became ingrained because there was something to it. Yes. Nobody, people weren't just making up random, you know, cloud spinning uh, fantasy stories, Fantastic Four fights Galactus. People weren't making up stuff like that. In order for there to be any kind of a tradition to preserve some kind of a story, there had to be something behind it. And there had to be a reason for remembering it and repeating it. A lot of it was cautionary tales. Hey, yeah. these things actually exist. Be aware of that. Don't get eaten. That's kind of a lot of why some of this stuff got passed around. And you know, with the uh, like the the um, the phone thing, where you tell somebody a story and then they tell it to somebody else, and it goes on down the line and it modifies. You know, you've probably done that in school. By the time you get to the last kid in the line, the story is completely different. Doesn't make any sense. That kind of stuff happens in history too. But on the other hand, there's a lot of cultures where they made you slavishly memorize things word for word some of these cultures didn't have written histories they made you memorize everything like the finish that have got the kalavala it, it takes like literally over two years to recite it and there yeah. had to be somebody in every group in whatever you know little outpost that had that memorized and they that was their job was to just show up repeat part of it show up again repeat the next part of it till you get to the end then start over again that was their yes. whole job. So, and that's, you know, a lot of the stuff um, people have said, well, you know, the Bible's been around for so long. It's been changed so many times, blah, 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 blah. And then they got the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And some of those were fragmentary versions of the early, early scriptures from like, you know, 1500 years ago. Guess what? They're word for word identical. Yeah. You know, it's so, I love the fact that you brought up history because, you know, like on my channel, one of the things also, not just live shows, is I get, I do subscriber encounters and emails. I do the encounters and, you know, and I and I publish them for these people. But, you know, what I just started doing, going back, as you've seen on my series, I've got a the classics or the history dating back to the 1800s, 1900s, where these true stories actually evolve from. And what it does is it gives us the setting for the here in the year 2000, because a lot of these stories from way back in the 18, 1900s, there's a couple of them I've already done, they all are relative to today, to today, because all these more modern stories we all hear of and get, they all have the same elements. They all have mm -hmm. the same elements. So that what that's what really, of course, I'm a knower. I know Bigfoot and these things exist, but for me, it really it puts it all together for everybody if it's for somebody that's on a fence. And I think the history of these things is really where we need to go. If you're starting out in the field, would you agree with that or no? Well, it certainly helps. And I, you know, I would say that just about anything knowing the history behind it is really yeah. helpful because sometimes what, what you think is going on really isn't what's going on until you study the history behind it. And you're like, Oh my God, that's completely yeah. different than what I thought it was. Well, and it makes more sense too, right? If you, oh, yeah. if you go back and take the time to look into them. Yep. You have to put everything in context. Again, this was like the, uh, the thing from the biblical times that everybody always gets bent out of shape about in the old Testament. Well, God's such a big meanie. He told him to go kill all of these poor, helpless people. <clears throat> Those weren't people. They were hybrids. You know. That's why. And if you don't know that little point, you just go on thinking God's a big meanie and then he just goes around and assassinates people. No, those weren't people. Right. Well, was it, I don't know much about the biblical sense of it, but wasn't, of course, there's the Adam and Eve and then they committed the sin, they ate the apple. And then were there, weren't some of us like Cain, they had, then you had Cain and Abel. I think Cain was the son of Adam who did he have, and he turned evil. Now, was that, if I recall, we're doing this Cain and Abel here. were the first two kids, and then they had another one after that because Cain killed Abel. And God right. got mad at him and chucked him out of there and made him go into the lands of Nod. And he yeah. said, oh, no, those people that live over there are going to kill me. Wait a minute. They're the first people on Earth. Who are the yeah. other people that live over there? Those are the pre-existing pre-Adamites that we've talked about quite yes, a long okay. time. Adam and Eve weren't the first people on Earth. They were the first people 
that were different that had souls let's just say maybe maybe that's the difference we don't know exactly but there are direct ancestors but there were other people on earth we know they exist we have the fossil record for them yes. homo neanderthalans you know uh De homo denisovan homo heidelbergensis homo luzon homo floresiensis homo didali there's all kinds of you know similar to us but not homo sapiens that were around at that time and I, I would imagine that the vast majority of them if there was any left got completely destroyed in the flood half and that was the end of them right but at the time that we appeared there were a lot of them around and that was kane's big question hey if i go over here with these guys they're gonna kill me because they're gonna tell you know i'm not one of them and yeah. god said well i'll give you a mark so that they'll leave you alone and they won't kill you nobody knows what the mark of cain was you know, there's been all kinds of hypothesizing. It changed his eye color or something, uh, made him grow a lot of hair on his body so the yeah. Sasquatch living over there didn't kill him or whatever. Nobody knows for sure. But he did found his own group of humans while hybridizing with these other people that carried on way further into biblical tradition and history. Okay. So was one of Cain's offspring, was that Enoch? Uh No. I don't think he was the father of Enoch. I'd have to look at that to be sure. Okay. Uh, but I think Enoch is from uh, directly from, I think almost all of those are directly from Adam's line. I don't think there's any biblical heroes that are okay. actually descendants of Cain. Cain was from the, eh, you're trash, get out <laughs> line yeah. that they didn't pay any attention to because bad boy killed your own brother. Yeah, and didn't, I think though, from the descendants of Cain, they took the seven sciences, I think, what I was reading, and they, but they use it against God or against, yeah. right, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, there's people talking about the, uh, you know, some of the weird science that's going on right now isn't even controlled by us. It's the uh, Anunnaki slash Nephilim yeah. that are making all this stuff because they think they can actually defeat God and they're willing to give it a go again. Right. So really quickly then, you've got the Nephilim that we talked about, the Rathian, which supposedly rose from rose from the dead now the anunnaki now where do they fit in place because that's well, another non-biblical that's the uh giants from the sumerian mythology oh, okay. but judging by the way they're described and everything it sounds like pretty much the same critters okay so you know unless i get some good information telling me that it's not the nephilim it probably is because they got the same legends all over the earth they just have different names for them you know in the levant in the holy land it's the the hybrid uh you know fallen angels with human uh, resulting offspring are the Nephilim. You know, right. I mean, their daddies weren't Nephilim. Their daddies were fallen angels. They were actually yeah. good angels until they decided to re rebel against God. Two of them, 200 of them came down here and started doing their job watching. They decided to go steal some mortal women and have their way with them yeah. and apparently make kids and whatnot. So that's at what point they got God really pissed off at them. <laughs> yeah. You know, this whole topic is so fascinating. So I remember maybe it was last year or two years ago, and I, you recommended I get the Gary Wayne book, uh, Genesis 6 Conspiracy, where it'll, it'll blow, your mind will explode, right? Yeah, don't read it all at once, your brain you, will short off. Yes, out. correct. And, <laughs> you know, and I still have questions today because I did read the book, but it's like, I got to read. It's, it's a book you don't read because I kind of read it quickly. It's a book that you've got to study because a lot of the answers, questions I have for you is in that book. But it's so, to me, there's so many bloodlines, there's so many siblings, so many offspring. It's just so hard to keep track, you know? Well, and it goes in so many directions, too, because there's oh, tons of weird stuff involved and conspiracies and yeah. secret orders and stuff. And this has been going on for thousands of years. So to unravel all of that is yeah, going to require a huge book. And it took him 30 years to do the damn yeah. thing. You know, yeah, you know, I've had Gary Wayne on a couple of times. He's absolutely amazing. But, uh, you know, uh, it's the. That's part of the problem with getting people to understand some of this stuff, because the volume of information that you have to go through to have a clear picture of it is just huge. And most people don't want to take the time to do that. But Gary recommends if you get a copy of his book, just read a chapter at a time. Read yeah. a chapter, digest it, go back, do some background research on that one chapter if you want to. I mean, as far as that goes, if you want show ideas. Just go through his book chapter by chapter. <laughs> oh, yeah, no doubt. And it's cool because in the back, he's got a setup where the bibliography is in the back where you can look up 
where he got his information, which then you can go online and look that up yep. and like fact check everything. So yeah, it's a great book. It's just man, it to do it correctly, it's gonna take you a year to read it. Yeah. Study like you were like if you're going to school, you know what I mean? So Yeah. Yeah, and that's the easiest way to do it, because like even Gary says, don't try and read it all at once. Your brain Yeah, no, nah, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> just read little chunks, digest down. You know. A couple years later, come back, reread it again. Now that you've read some of the other stuff, it'll make more sense. Yeah. You know, it's funny, we we go back now. So here I am talking Nephilim, talking giants. It's so strange how I had a Bigfoot encounter 2018 again. We all know how many, if, once I started getting involved with this Duke, I couldn't tell you today how many different rabbit holes just that one encounter took. Now I'm, it takes you everywhere. And then it not only takes you through the cryptids, but now it also leads you down these governmental organizations right these abc outfits you know how they want this new world order i mean isn't that weird how one encounter takes you to a different dimension a different realm of all these things that i had no clue about five years ago yeah uh, yeah it's kind of a trade-off it does two things first of all it freaks you out because it makes yeah. you aware of a lot of stuff you weren't aware of but on the positive side it puts everything in perspective and and a lot clearer focus so things previously that you would look at and go why in the hell are they doing this yeah. you can now look at it and go the stupid shits <laughs> i know why they're doing this you yeah. idiots knock it off <laughs> yeah it's, it's just a couple of everything yeah it's opened my mind to a lot of things man that's for sure and uh and so well and the one one main takeaway from that is that uh there are people that are completely frickin' evil and do really stupid things because they're completely frickin' evil. And then there's their pawns, which like scientists, lots of lots of scientists are their pawns. Because although the scientists are very intelligent, their wisdom is very, very little. These are the same people that when they were playing around with the first nuclear bomb, the Los Alamos and all that kind of stuff, well, let's test it. The scientists on hand were laying side bets on whether this nuke would actually ignite the atmosphere and destroy the Earth. They didn't know for sure. Some of them were actually betting that it would, which is kind of peculiar if you think about it. How are you going to collect on your bet when the Earth is destroyed, morons? This tells you these people have no friggin' wisdom whatsoever. They may right. be really smart, but they haven't got any common sense. And these are the people you don't want to give a limitless budget and big toys like CERN. Right, because yeah, they'll definitely they'll, they'll be do the something the stupid. World. Yep, exactly. Yes. And they'll be like, "Oh, I destroyed the world, but I discovered this interesting constant." And <laughs> who gives a shit? You destroy the world, you're a moron. Right. You know, they'll destroy the world, not even want to destroy the world because of their ignorance. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I mean, <clears throat> ignorance is curable, but stupidity is forever. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and yeah, it goes again, back. that has to do with wisdom. It's not just a pure yeah. intelligence is the ability to, uh, as far as I'm concerned anyway, the ability to take in information, correlate it correctly, and then output it again. Yeah. Well, that's what you learn in college. You digest information, you regurgitate it in the way that your teacher wants you to, and then they give you a good grade, whether that's accurate or not. That's the way your teacher yeah. wants you to. Uh, that has nothing to do with common sense. That has right. to do with memorizing, regurgitating information, which is what most of these people are really excellent at. Some yeah. of them have the capacity to think outside the box and to come up with their own theories and hence new things get discovered. But as far as having any common sense on what the hell they're doing or why they should even be doing it, apparently they have none. Yeah. It's whoever will pay me the big money, I'll go do their stupid research, whatever they want me to work on. Yeah. And too, like you say, it's all about applying the knowledge you learn in college. You apply it, and you're just, like you said, you just don't memorize and regurgitate because that's nothing. You should, the, the people that are successful, that are the people you want to follow, are the people that use that and think out of the box using that information. You know, it reminds me of the person who just thinks that these people that think that, let's say, Bigfoot's just totally strictly flesh and blood, they can't do anything and they have blinders on. Well, you got to, as time moves on, in any subject, you have to open up your mind to different things. Yeah. And, uh, and so, because you don't want to be stale, you don't want to be stagnant, you got to move forward. 
And, uh, hey, I was talking to Ron Moorhead. He's been on my show many times, twice, three times. And he told me 30 years ago, if somebody he interviewed believed in the woo, he says, get out of my office. I'm, this interview's over. And now he's a big advocate of it, right? Yeah, so, he wrote the Quantum Bigfoot. Yeah. There you go. Yes, yeah, so there you go. So, but see again, he has some he has some wisdom because he's learned from what's going yeah, on. He's not right. stuck in the same little box, the little teeny doctrinal box that these other people put themselves in. Uh, and like I always like to remind them, if Bigfoot is an ape running around the woods and you're looking yeah. for Bigfoot, where's all your beautiful pictures? Because if you don't have any evidence and you haven't been able to do anything at this point, all you're proving is that a big dumb ape running around the woods is smarter than you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And the Michigan Rob and all his 30 channels. Yeah, you know, it's actually, let's not get everyone confused. Bigfoot Michigan Rob is my channel. Please subscribe. And the guys, you know about tax. I got to throw him some props. Texas Front Porch. But I also am a writer for Steve Stockton. I write for two of his channels, the uh, Among the Missing and um, 13 Past Midnight. So I'm a writer for him. I have been for several months, and we're just launching these channels. And, uh, well, 13 Past Midnight's been out for a while, but the newer one is really going to be cool. So I write for him. And uh, and other than that, I'm doing a bunch of other stuff, and uh, I'm popping around everyone's chat rooms. And, and of course, we're on five days a week. You guys know where to find me. I'm not going to go through the schedule. I only do that during the show. And really, we don't have time for it because it'd be another fifteen minutes longer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's that's if Rob tells you the the schedule. If you get yeah. text to do it, we're going to be here until tomorrow. So there's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Tex. Yeah. Hey, Tex. Yeah, I think Texas. Yeah, he might be working tonight, so I don't know. I I, I still don't know what his hours are. He's at any rate, he's all right. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. All righty. Well, with that, everybody go sub uh, BMR's channel. Check out all his 30 podcasts that he turns out every week. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, time permitting in between sleeping and working, maybe you can right, catch some of them. <laughs> Definitely go. encourage you to do that. All the guys that he works with and all their channels really good, too. I especially like Jason Siru Papers channel. You know, Jason may look like an adult Eric Cartman, but he's nothing like Eric Cartman. <laughs> <laughs> and he's really smart and does really good research. So you yeah. definitely want to go check his channel out. Yeah. And um, that's about it. So anyway, glad you guys could uh, stop in and check it out and hang out with me and BMR here for a little while. Don't forget that you want to, you know, like I said, go sub his channel, check his content out. He gets really good guests. And uh, he's at uh, Beyond BMR and Bigfoot Michigan Rob and Brunch with BMR and yeah. Beyond Brunch with Big BMR yeah, you know, and, and BMR, BMR does Brunch Beyond and BMR's all these... around the corner BMR's <laughs> in your attic BMR's lurking outside your window it's not Bigfoot it's BMR <laughs> yeah and the new show oh my god I opened the door and there was BMR <laughs> it's oh my god another show oh my god I hate this show wait a minute I'm on tonight I didn't know that yeah at the latest show does BMR ever sleep <laughs> yeah it's getting close not really i get a bang out of it honestly because a lot of these shows they're not rob's show he's a co-host but he's on everything yeah <laughs> and sometimes yeah. the host can't make it and he takes the damn show over for him which is even funnier <laughs> yeah like i know. and i'm called to do other people's shows too which i do like to do so so, yeah, that hasn't been in a couple months, but I got a whole bunch slated that I'm going to be on, I think, uh, end of March, early April. So that's always good to sit back like this and not do the questioning and just kind of BS. Yep. So. And the Siru papers, they're doing this whole series on the Nephilim giants and stuff right now. Yeah. I'm going to be on one of them coming up. Yes. So there's something worth looking yep. at. Best Wednesdays at 9 in the East. So. Right on. See, he even knows what time all these dozens of shows that he's Oh, yeah. Have. I know. <laughs> Got it memorized. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like when you do the cool jazz thing in the background and then you and the next show. Yeah. Uh, Thursday we've got sometimes when I feel it, you know, you gotta mix it off, get a little <laughs> <laughs> do the the sexy sultry jazz man voice. <laughs> and as you know, Jason McLean questions everything. Yeah. Wednesday is not at ease. 
ladies, I know you get a tingle out of this show. You yeah. want it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's funny to talk about ladies. I mean, this is just, I go, I'm looking over the analytics on the Bigfoot Mr. Rob channel. I'm up, I'm at like, it's pretty even, man. I got like 50, the ladies are starting to pick it up. I got like 50%, 58% men and 42% women. And before it was like 70, 30. So the women are like they're cryptids. Yeah. You want to hear about some lame slackers here. Over yeah. 80% of my audience are male oh. and over 50%, well over 50% of my actual co-producers are female. Oh my Lord. Wow. Go figure that. So right? yeah, the ladies are the ones that are helping keep the show going. So all the lazy slothful guys can lay around, <laughs> belch and drink beer and pour it on themselves and go, Hey, hell, great show. Thanks yeah, for funding it, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. All right, you guys, we, we love you, and you know what the drill is, and make yep. sure that you follow it. Here we go. We're going to give you the instructions all over again uh, at the end of the show, and we'll see you next week. I have three amazing shows lined up, including one with the biggest name in Bigfoot. All if right. No one can get on their show. They're going to be on mine shortly. Oh, sweet. Very good. I'll be looking forward to it. Big, big tease. Think about this one. Who's the biggest name in Bigfooting that nobody can get on their show? That's who's going to oh. be on the show. Well, All shit, right. that, I just been out tonight, so no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got you on the show, so that one's off the list now. That's yeah, it's off the list, dang it. Because Rob is doing 30 shows a week, so he hasn't got time to do anybody else's show. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah. All right, you guys. Love you. Everybody take care. Be good. Follow the rules. See you next week.